whether Christianity, whether America had a Christian founding, what are the different debates? What it's, it's like this. I, I was a geek, but I wanted to turn on C-SPAN and I wanted to see what the different um, people were talking about. Okay, it's the same thing for everyone. We want to we want to turn on the news and want to see what the latest is, right? We want to watch the news and see what the latest of anything is. That's cool. But I, I want to know actually about better stuff than just the people killing people. You know, I want to know about actually the real issues going on in the world and not just what the news decided to put out. So how much better would it be instead of like, you know, following sports, if I could follow the debates, if I could follow the research that you're doing, that's really cool. Like there's a, a good 100,000 people in this, in this nation that want to do that. Um, basically, everyone that is in college or just graduated college and had interest in these things, that's a lot of people. And then lot, I bet you that a good majority of people care about deep issues. But um, just imagine like um, that, just like you can track what's happening, you know, in the news, I can track what's happening in, in the thought world. I can track what debates, debates you're having. Uh, oh yeah, so-and-so just published an article um, and it really it was a hard one to defeat. And so, and I can see the, uh, how you, what your response was and so forth. So there is the entertainment value of it and the tracking of what's um, happening in the current debate uh, between thought leaders. But also there's just simply like, hey, if I'm gonna, I want to figure out who to follow. I wanna figure out who to follow. So instead of following, only being able to follow Mark, Mike Levin and Glenn Beck, great. But I wanna be able to follow, figure out who else to follow, like you. Like I, I, the thesis is that the smartest people in the world are unknown. The people that we can learn the most from, no one knows about. And that's true, right? Because academia, academia trains us to only write for our peers, mostly, mm -hmm. right? Right. And, and so then when you, public, when you publish to the um, general audience, people that actually need this information, like it used to be, um, you just, all you can do is write a book. But then how do people find out about the book? Um, that's what I built a system to solve. So I built a way to build campaigns for ideas for politics, for thought leaders to run campaigns and build a viral community. And then allow, because then it allows the individual themselves, who is the audience, to become a viral thought leader, a viral activist, who then can then curate their own network of people. So the paradigm shift is taking from passive consumers um, who only watch the news to being able to watch the smart people like you and our networks, and then turning people, the, the consumers, into actually participants, active participants, into informed citizens who then can then um, share, be, be a thought, be a thought curator for their networks. And then they can read all these smart people and then they can curate to their people and they can develop other thought leaders down here and they can build new groups down there. So it's a way to build grassroots network, networks just like we had with Paul Revere. Um, he wrote in a town and he knew who to talk to. He knew who to spread the information with. So we can have that sort of, those sort of systems in place. Because right now, if Facebook were to die or to shut us all off, and Twitter, if Facebook were to shut us all off, we as a conservative movement would be really, it'd be really hard for us to share information. Right. And, but the problem is, it's already like that. It's already like that. I would never have seen your posts about your debate unless I had just thought to message you a few days before. Mm -hmm. right? So um, you can pick who to follow and you're, you're not, it's not going to go away if you don't keep engaged with them. Things like that. So a way is to solve censorship, uh, organizing the news, um, showing arguments, solving fake news, by, having, by forcing some people to show arguments and then seeing the history behind ideas and easily figure, being able to figure out what I should read if I want to know about the Civil War or about um, the history of revolutions. And oh, can I, how quickly can I easily, how easily could I see that this revolution is following the playbook of every revolution we run in Eastern Europe and in Iran, which was my area in Tehran, um, the revolution that's happening right now is functioning exactly the same way. But how would we know that? How would we have access to any of this information? It's like the left has been um, 
able to achieve the goal of controlling what we read and see by building systems like I'm talking about right now, this mine ours is a free ver is a free world, a free thinking version of it. They built one where um, there's algorithms that control what everyone sees and reads. So the vision is to be able to um, connect people and make it like it used to be where we could have access to information when we wanted to and figure out what we should read. Um, is be able to be able to talk to you, but making a thousand people be able to talk to you so that I could go on to your thought leadership blog and have the same experience intellectually as I'm having right now, as I will just have in a few minutes talking to you. So I can see the layout of all of everything you know. And there's even I think a smart way to do it is that I, we subscribe to you and pay you 20 bucks a month. That's what I think. So you get premium access to your knowledge for 20 bucks a month or whatever it is. And there's different le levels to that. Um, just like you would subscribe to the blaze, but you can subscribe to indiv individual people. So it's flipping the power structure of how thought leadership has been controlled. Um, and there's a lot of implications for universities, which I think is a very good idea. Um, is a very, we have now the mechanisms for which I could then, um, I could become a student of yours for, you know, maybe a hundred bucks a month, maybe a thousand bucks a month. Um, and then I could get some sort of accreditation from you, but I would be able to have access to all your information. And then you could teach me at scale because I would have access to all those books you have over there and how you've, um, interpreted them and read them and parsed them out. So here, have you ever read the, um, the great books of the Western world, um, to, to set produced by Mortimer J. Adler. Yeah. Sure, I know what you're talking about. I've, I've never read straight through them, but I've read a number of them. Well, in the 50s, in 53, he took a bunch of um, PhD candidates at the University of Chicago, back when that was a good school, and they cataloged all the great ideas. They read through all of the 54 great books at the time, and they cataloged how all the great ideas weaved in through all of them. Um, and they described how each author from Plato, Aristotle, so forth, discussed each idea. And so um, we can easily do that um, for every other idea at scale by simply doing this. I interview you, you talk, you tell me very easily for you in words, talking, the, what's, what, what's the most important thing going on in a, in a certain issue. And then I download that, put it into your thought leadership blog, and it's done. And I had this vision um, when I was in school, back with Judith Mendelssohn Rood uh, at Biola, um, that every student can do this. When they go and do their thesis, they have a, a conversation with a professor about to guide them in the research. Every student then just puts that into the professor's thought leadership blog. So it's a way of, of organizing the research they do when they talk to the professor. It's scalable and it's easy and it's beautiful. So students, mm -hmm. while they're doing their work for their own thesis, they then can map um, information into the professor's thought leadership blog. And then all his, all his or her students can have access to that thought leadership blog evermore. And it's scalable. So now, instead of ideas just going into your filing cabinet in a, in a um, research papers, they're now cataloged in a system that uh, the good ones can, be, can remain. And you could have a plethora of thousands of different debates and issues that are um, mapped for your future students to look up. Um, so it, then it makes the library concept seem a lot different. So instead of just having like JSTOR, random keywords, imagine if you have professors who are mapping the ideas. And so if you go, to a, you go to one university, you get all those professors, all their intellectual history, intellectual ideas, and how they mapped all their current debates. So it's like being able, to have, being able to have conversations one-on-one -on -one with each professor, but in a database. I can go on and say, well, what, is, what are the most important ideas about um, the American founding? Mm -hmm. Well, if I were to do that right now, even if I were to go to George Fox as a 19-year-old, 18-year-old, 19, 20-year-old, um, and be a junior and go about the research, I would be starting from square one. <laughs> and it would, I would have the same experience going to your library as any other university. 
right? Um, I, but I would have to go and talk to each professor individually. That's a good idea, but wouldn't it be better if I could read all of their literature reviews first mm -hmm. and then talk to them about actually have better discussions instead of you telling me the same thing as you told every other student. Okay, well, here's a, you, you should read this book and this book and this book. Why not skip that, have that scalable? That's the idea. Um, so lots of ideas about that. Um, so that's the um, deal. Yeah. What a project. I, I like this a lot. This sounds very interesting. Because you're right, you know, the Civil War is a great analogy, too, because you have, what, maybe 500,000 books on the Civil War? You know, how does one know where to begin? It's so easy to be deceived. Like even my, my wife was getting all this, oh gosh, she's gonna, she's gonna not like that I'm talking about this, but she was getting, we were watching the um, Steven Spielberg Lincoln movie the other night. And she was reading apparently some blogs during, during it about Lincoln. And then she got written about him being gay or not. I was like, the most important moments in world history and freedom, slavery, and balance of power. And, you're, yeah, and you got sucked away into, um, the blog sucked her away into, she's a very smart lady, very smart, but the blogs got her attracted and deceived and she think about homosexuality and Lincoln. Um, this is what an evil version of me would do. This is what Google would do. This is what the left would do. They would plant ideas all over the place. And so I, I guarantee, I just know instinctually that the top books on Amazon right now are books you don't want to read about Lincoln. Right. Because they're going to be planted there. Um, and so how do we counter that? And we would be blind for another 50 years, like we've been for the last 30 years now, since the 90s, 20, yeah, 20 years, mm -hmm. last 20 years, we've been blind by this system. Um, and we would continue on being really smart in what you're doing. You'd be really smart, have all these smartest people, but no one knows about them unless they, you know, we'd be, we'd be blocked and handcuffed and squashed by big tech. Yeah, excellent. So, All right. Well, I like it. Well, should we get on with the podcast? Yeah, please. That, that's great. Yeah. It's good to see you without a mask, by the way. It's nice to see your face again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. nice. Um, I guess I don't, the, the thing that 